Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nick Evdikimov. We are continuing our video series on investment in cryptocurrency startups, tokens, and ICOs. Today, the topic of my video is token economy, which we will look at from the perspective of token supply. In our previous video, we covered all things about the demand within the token economy. As you may recall, the token economy has two components which are supply and demand. As the number of tokens in circulation decreases, the demand for them increases because tokens are now sought after by crypto investors. This results in the token having now a higher purchasing power on the cryptocurrency market. And this, in a nutshell, is how the demand for tokens works. Let's use an example. In this particular one, we will be looking at a system within the Internet of Things built into a blockchain. Our example is about the agriculture. In agriculture, there's a system of selling futures of produce grown on greenhouse farms. The way it works is that a buyer is offered to purchase produce at an early stage during its planting. A purchaser has an opportunity to buy crops at a significant discount. The purchaser then receives crops after they are fully grown, harvested, and shipped off. Of course, blockchain participates in this process to ensure quality, as well to track the process at every stage of farming. This means that the Internet of Things, or IoT in short here, is the use of sensors that track temperature, amount of lighting, and humidity levels for the growing produce. The system also records all information on the blockchain. That is, when investors purchase futures for a particular agriculture or produce, they can be sure that the quality of the product will not suffer. The produce will be of satisfactory quality because it is closely monitored at every stage of the process. Now I will do my best to draw a model of how this works. Here we will label our buyers, and here are the sellers. We have the price of the crops, and the price of the crops is always measured in liquid currency, whether it is in dollars, bitcoin, litecoin, or ethereum. The token is used as a tool to implement what is called a smart contract. This smart contract carries out the escrow functions. Everything is very simple. The buyer buys the crops and pays for them in tokens. The seller then receives these tokens and can either convert or sell them. Let me show you how this works. In doing so, I will be describing the model of demand and how the token works from within this model. In the previous video, we discussed the model of a service commission. As you may recall, it worked on the gas model, where the user of the service was charged a commission in tokens. So if the user paid this commission in dollars or in bitcoins, then the project would convert this commission into tokens. These tokens would be frozen on the company account or completely burned. And by the way, there are so many options of reducing quantity of tokens on the market instead of burning them. So today we will look at this procedure more carefully. Let's start with an example. Let's say we have a startup and a buyer likes the price of goods offered to him by this startup. After he chooses a method of payment for these goods, either in US dollars or bitcoins, he then makes the payment. During the payment process, the tokens are purchased automatically. But the buyer may not see them. He just paid with dollars or bitcoins and that's it. He paid for the goods and was automatically awarded tokens within the system interface. So the buyer is unaware of them altogether as this process is fully automated. His purchase tokens are transferred transferred to the startup or to the seller in this case. The seller then has the option to either keep the tokens or exchange them back to dollars on a cryptocurrency exchange so that they can stay in his account. So what is the point of this example? Well, we see that the model in which the entire token economy happening here is instantaneous. In this case, the buyer purchased goods for, let's assume, $1,000 and the seller received this $1,000. The $1,000 is then exchanged for X number of tokens, which went to the seller's account and then were converted into dollars through a crypto exchange and subsequently withdrawn. This is a model that works instantly. Now let's get back to our startup that sells futures. The funds that come in are automatically frozen in the startup's account, which is part of the whole system. At the time when the crops are harvested and shipped to the buyer, the frozen funds within the system have to be released to the seller. Furthermore, there are methods that are used to motivate both parties in the given system to store as many tokens and wallets as possible in the form of cryptocurrencies. This helps promote the demand for the tokens while the quantity of the tokens on the market gets reduced due to them being frozen. Now let's look at these incentive-based methods, which are used to create token demand based on different scenarios. Let's start with what is done in most cases. When we analyze the startup, we understand that it must follow certain principles, and now I am going to explain these principles. Here is what is happening here. We have incentives for customers to buy tokens for future use. So a startup is always trying to get customers to buy additional tokens even when a customer is in the process of paying for merchandise. 
Why? Well, because after the end of the ICO, the price of the token will start to increase. If during an ICO a certain product was $1,000 and the token price was $1, then the buyer had gotten 1,000 tokens. Ultimately, when the $1 token goes in price to $2 per token, then for the same 1,000 tokens you can purchase goods worth $2,000. If a seller stores in his account not dollars or bitcoins but tokens, then the growth of the token leads to him getting not $1,000 but $2,000 when he sells them. This is a very clear and transparent example. This is why I try to motivate both sides to ensure that they hold on to as many tokens as possible on their accounts and turn them into fiat or cryptocurrency as rarely as possible or as late as possible. Now let's examine another scenario. This scenario is different from the one we just looked at, where I recommend that both parties of the process keep their funds and tokens. In this scenario, we will be focusing on the seller in the following way. Let's say that our sellers have not gotten fully vetted yet, and we have not yet verified how reliable or trustworthy they are. What a startup can offer to these sellers is to keep all of their funds and their accounts and tokens. Now we must note that this works well for a short period of time and may not work long term. As in the case of the farmer startup, when the cycle is four months long and anything can happen to tokens during that time. So our approach is very simple. We incentivize both parties, investors and sellers, to use their tokens as an escrow. The more farmers agree to keep funds and tokens, the better it will work for everyone. This point underlines the fact that there are different methods of motivation depending on the situation. In another scenario, we can require all unverified farmers to store some money, let's say half of it in tokens and the other half in dollars. Why? For a simple reason. The margin in this business is high, so because of this high margin, the risk is only half of the process. We can incentivize farmers even more by telling them that if they keep their money in tokens, they get an additional profit of 10%, leave the tokens on your account, and for every token you will get 10% interest. Again, all this will contribute to the token buyout, so we can incentivize token purchasers through all these different approaches. Now let's review a scenario where the token cycle is short, unlike in the 4 month long case we discussed just now when you have to grow crops. Let's now say that the sale only lasts for a 2 week period. In this case sellers can be strictly asked to keep money and tokens for the whole 2 weeks. As a result we can provide a 2 week lag from the moment the tokens are received by the seller until the time they get rid of them. Many of the sellers will get used to it and continue to keep tokens in the system. This is due to the incentives that they are getting. In this case, we have a two-week turnover that is continually dropping out of circulation. With constant growth of demand, there will always be a short supply of tokens on the market. If today a token can be bought for an X amount, in a month when people begin to get rid of their tokens because they need to sell their next batch of goods, now the demand is higher. It will be X multiplied by 1.1, so the growth is now 10%, so we always need more and more tokens. Knowing this will be the case, we try to motivate our buyers to keep their tokens in their wallets. We also motivate the sellers to keep their escrow and tokens as well. We cannot, however, be sure that they will follow our advice. But for all of the sellers, we definitely ask that they keep all their money in tokens for a short period of time. After that, they can convert tokens into dollars with a profit. This may work differently in different ICOs, but let's look at an escrow scenario when funds are stored in tokens and are issued and transferred to the sellers at various stages. Let's say there are four stages for each product that we are dealing with and each lasts one month. Now if we issue out 25% of the funds during each of the four stages, this will be the first month, the second month, the third, and the fourth month. So we'll take a look at these four stages. Our money was kept in a wallet and half of it was in tokens while the other half is in dollars. This is how our system works and this is how we make an offer to our, let's say, farmers. This offer will sound good to them and the offer will be appealing for the following reason. With the profit margin being as high as it is, the farmer feels comfortable with half of his future sales and tokens. Why? Because the value of the product is defined in dollars, so it makes sense for him when the other half of the funds is released through various stages in the process. In our case, because all the stages of the growth of products are recorded in the blockchain with the conclusion of each stage, funds from escrow are released and become available to the seller. At this time, we understand that the farmer has both dollars and tokens, so he can sell a quarter of his funds, because this is the first stage of four multiplied by one half. So this gives us one eighth of the total token turnover for this month that will be released. At the same time, the demand is for the 100% of the tokens in the system. This means that we'll have an absolutely transparent token growth of 8 times for the first month. Why? Because we are selling 1 eighth of the monthly token turnover while the demand is for 100% of the tokens. 
As the system is growing, the number of users is growing with an increasing turnover. So at each stage, we get an eight-time growth due to the ratio of supply and demand. We should apply all available models and methods of reducing the volume of token supply or the number of tokens in the ecosystem. This is our key task. When we analyze a startup, we must understand how it intends to accomplish this task. Therefore, we must ask the startup directly how they are decreasing the volume of tokens in circulation. Let's picture a scenario where the commission system within the startup takes about five percent for providing its service on the market, which works for this kind of e-commerce, especially in a model where everything is built on escrow, the Internet of Things, and so on. So how does this look? During a transfer of one thousand dollars from point A to point B, we have one thousand dollars on the crypto exchange. So with that, we have X amount of tokens that automatically go to the buyer. Within this amount, roughly point nine five percent from X tokens passes to our seller, and point zero five percent from X tokens are the commission paid to the startup. This percentage can be burned, just as we discussed in the previous video. So our service commission gets burned. This is a very concrete decrease in the number of tokens in the turnover of the crypto economy. This is a guaranteed process, so 0.95% of tokens are transferred to the wallet of the seller. Then we move on to the model described here. As you can see, we have all finances divided inside escrow into four stages. Half of the money is stored in dollars and half in tokens. We understand that the demand for tokens is constantly growing, while their sales decrease with each of the four stages. Even if the demand for the token does not grow, we still have a one to eight growth. If the demand increases, we must multiply this ratio of one to eight by the very multiplier that is achieved by the increasing demand. This example is shown here. The method for calculating the supply and demand of tokens should work the same way. Also, we should always have an idea of how many tokens are in circulation. Naturally, after the ICO, we understand that only a part of the tokens, say one third, for example, will go to the crypto exchange, as the rest of the tokens will remain untouched. We just analyze where demand comes from. With this in mind, we need to add only one additional component: the holding component, that is, the freezing of tokens on the accounts, and the component of reducing the tokens in the system turnover. This is a single component known as the reduction of tokens in the turnover over a period of time. When we take into account the total volume of tokens as well as the number of token reduction in the system, we then can figure out how the demand is growing. If tokens are reduced by dividing supply by demand, then we know the multiplier that will allow us to calculate the tokens growth as well as the demand. Again, as I said earlier, here we are only talking about the natural component of the demand. We are not talking about an artificial speculative component. Therefore, taking the speculative component off the table, we come to see a clear picture. If we predicted that in our system within a month, let's say during the eighth month, the token grows 12 times in value, then we can have a realistic forecast that the speculation will be added and our times 12 turn into times 24. This is a good and a conservative speculation because to say that it will raise the price of our token times 10 is probably not accurate. However, a healthy speculation at times 2 is conservative and has fairly good odds. Based on these facts, we can make a healthy calculation and have a balanced model of supply and demand by understanding our expectations for potential growth of our tokens. In my illustrations, crypto exchanges are one of the elements of an ecosystem, which is a vital part of the process. It provides technology and mechanism for buying and selling tokens with bitcoins or dollars, and sending tokens from one user to another before they are frozen. Later, these users send tokens to exchanges and convert them into fiat. This may seem difficult to grasp, and you may think, "Who needs such a startup, and who is able to use it?" Startups should set this up right from the start, so that it is not noticeable to investors. This is done automatically and from within the system, so we do not have any risks here. But we should know on which exchanges the startup is going to list its tokens, and investors should ask this directly and pay close attention to the answers. Never be shy to ask about the token turnover reduction or about cryptocurrency listings. Many times I heard a startup saying, "We'll have an organic demand growth, so the token price will increase." Wrong. If a startup has a ten million dollar demand for its services in one month, and then the next month its turnover is twenty million, but there's no reduction of tokens on the market, here's what happens. So, 10 million tokens are purchased, and 10 million tokens are sold immediately, as the tokens are not held long or frozen or taken off circulation. This will only lead to the token price staying the same. If 10 million more tokens are purchased and sold in one day, nothing will change within the token price on the market. So, only by freezing the tokens on accounts through strict processes and through motivations, as well as by burning own tokens and taking them out of circulation, can bring success. 
So to sum it up, always make sure that startups burn their commission tokens. It is very important and it is good for all parties involved. With that, the startup counts on tokens it owns to grow in price and get more purchasing power. The startup should motivate both parties within the system to ensure that the tokens remain in user wallets by keeping them frozen for as long as possible. The startup should apply such methods as using escrow and release of funds and parts as much as possible and even force this policy. We can certainly count on motivation, but at the same time, we should also implement the strategy I just described. Now this is where the startup itself can ask a lot of questions, such as how will we encourage people to invest in our tokens? Here's advice that can help. First, this should be the effort of your sales team. They should explain that the longer the tokens are kept in wallets, the more they will grow in price, which is very profitable to the seller. But you should not count on this and it should also work for the seller. Hold and freeze such a portion of his tokens that he is okay with. These frozen tokens can be used to motivate the seller in addition to any bonuses that he gets in tokens. And this works well. To wrap up today, we touched upon several very important points. Overall, the demand for tokens should go up and the supply should go down. We divide supply by demand and get a multiplier. This should be a transparent and simple math. You do it one, two, or three times and learn how to do it quickly. When you join a startup, it is crucial that you do this drill. When I talk to a startup or help it prepare a pitch, I always pay attention to the issues I cover today. The supply and demand calculations will be an integral part of white papers, one pagers and landing pages for each startup. They must clearly explain how the business is set up and why the purchasing power of tokens will increase. We are not talking about any speculative components, but we say that you can both buy and use tokens. You don't have to sell them, you can just use them and increase its purchase power and it's all logical. You can learn more and find contact information on my website. Please feel free to get in touch with me with any questions. In my next video I will discuss how to analyze startups documentation. I will list questions that we should ask when interviewing a startup. Thank you very much for your time.